Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, it's six o'clock and um, welcome to the first in the series of a pro series of programs on 9-11 called Remembering 9-11 Before, After, and Since. Uh, in this series, and this is uh, our first topic looks at engineer stories, uh, kind of under told um, and really important uh, story of the immediate uh, reaction to 9-11, the recovery, um, eventually the rebuilding story um, that we're going to tell in two parts. And tonight's panel focuses on, um, in a way, the before, <laughs> the after and the aftermath of 9-11. Um, and in the second program, we're going to turn to the kind of second long span of time, the since 9-11, the looking back from the 20th anniversary back 20 years ago. And of course we're going to be doing that tonight, but really in terms of this, this, this um, framing of time, the kind of short burst of the immediacy of the moment, the horror of the moment of 9-11 that we're all going to be either reliving or seeing on, on, on film and, and documentaries um, that bring some of us back to that moment or that it's try to explain it to others who weren't uh, born yet or who were too, too young to have registered anything. We're trying tonight to look at the um, immediate day of 9-11, the immediate aftermath um, of the destruction of the World Trade Center Twin Towers and the dealing with the materials um, uh, on the site during the recovery. And for that, we have an extraordinary panel of engineers who have been long involved um, with the World Trade Center. And um, I, um, friend and colleague and uh, board member of the Skyscraper M Museum, Najid Aboud, uh, who is the uh, a managing director at Thornton Tomasetti is going to be introducing the speakers as well as moderating the panel. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention in the context of how I met Najib, it, uh, who has who devoted a, a good 10 years of his career on the forensic investigations of why the towers fell. Um, I met Najib as part of an oral history project that Thornton Tomasetti undertook last year um, with Jim Kent and others at, at TT, uh, in order to try to um, bring some kind of memory uh, at the two decade marker of the experience of the engineers who, who worked at TT were very closely um, involved. And of course, Richard Tomasetti uh, of, is one of our, our speakers tonight. So um, it was that oral history project um, for which Amy Weinstein of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum conducted the oral history interviews of um, eight or nine engineers at TT, um, all for 90 minutes or more. And it was that long um, kind of unfolding of stories um, where I sat to the side and, and posed a few questions after that impressed upon me the importance of the subject that we're going to address tonight, and that is the engineers' experience, especially structural engineers, but also foundation engineers. George Tomorrow um, mm -hmm. is with us tonight, and he worked on the original World Trade Center, um, who brought their knowledge, their rational thinking, um, their expertise uh, to dealing with the horror that was that day and then the order um, that came out of that. Um, and rather than, than say more than that, um, I wanna share my, my screen, um, a few images that um, evoke uh, some of the monumental scale of uh, the destruction on that day. And so let me just go through, through a few slides that show um, immediately after 9-11, um, a few days later in that week where you can see um, the site almost entirely collapsed, um, where we kind of come down closer to the ground in order to see the amount of materials. You see the members of the World Trade Center that fell on the World Financial Center um, Winter Garden. Um, you see um, on the, from the ground level, uh, the, the scale of uh, the material uh, you see on the uh, 
eye level, um, the scale even over your head um, of the debris on the site, uh, and a couple of more images in order um, to come to this map that was created by the um, Structural Engineers Association of New York, Sioni, uh, in order to map the level of destruction of the buildings that surrounded the site. So it's the scope of um, the immediate time after 9-11 to, um, to the concerted rational uh, actions in order to try to bring some order and, um, and method um, to the recovery on the site that is our subject um, for this evening. So I'm going to invite Najib Abu to come onto the screen. As I mentioned, he's a managing um, uh, principal at Thornton Tom Setti. Um, and Najib is going to, I'm going to unshare my screen and we're going to then invite all of the other speakers to come onto the screen. I'll turn my camera off, but I will be watching the chat box uh, in case we do have time uh, for questions at the end of our um, 70 minutes or so uh, in order to pose questions to the panel. Thank you, Carol. Good evening, everyone. Um, we've assembled today, as Carol has um, stated, an amazing panel of people who've lived the entire history of the World Trade Center, some of them from its very inception, uh, most of them during um, the, uh, the events of 9-11, its immediate aftermath, and a lot of them were ultimately part of the recovery um, and the rebuild of the World Trade Center. Let me first start by introducing Fla Frank Lombardi. Frank is the former chief engineer of the Port Authority. He held that position between 1995 until his retirement in 2010. Frank has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from NYU and a master's degree from Columbia University. And after his retirement, he went back to teaching both at Manhattan College and at NYU. During his tenure, and Frank has had a long tenure at the Port Authority, he's literally touched and worked on every single asset that the Port Authority um, oversees and manages. And few people know the extent of that collection. It includes major airports, bridges, under river tunnels, the World Trade Center, and maritime ports. But Frank has the distinction, and I'll let you use the adjective for that, of having lived through the, the February 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He led its recovery and the reopening of the World Trade Center two months later in April 1993. Frank, unfortunately, was there again on September 11, 2001. He will tell you that story, but Frank pay, played a critical role as part of a committee of Port Authority executives that was assembled to deal with the immediate aftermath of 9-11, looking after the well-being of the Port Authority staff, especially the survivors and the families of those lost, as well as dealing with all of the challenges that the Port Authority was encountering at that time story that few people though know because it's never publicized, Frank was critical to the injection of innovative technologies post 9-11 that secured most of the Port Authority assets and continues to do so since then. I would like to start with uh, Frank. Frank, you were there in the building on 9-11 the first time I heard that story 20 years ago, it marked me profoundly, both from its uh, human side, but there is the engineer, there is the, um, the leader that had staff both lost and recovering, not knowing on that uh, same very day. Um, clearly a difficult experience, but I think it's history and we need to retell it for future generations. So Frank, your words would be valuable. Thank you, Najib. Um, I was involved in the 93 bombing, as Najib mentioned, 
And little did I know that that 93 bombing would lead to a Port Authority building effort that saved countless lives, including my own on 9-11. So in 93, I was trapped in an elevator with eight fellow workers, seven of whom were engineers, and the other two were attorneys. We managed to get out and safely walk down 58 flights of stairs, but in total darkness. Imagine each of us having one hand extended on the shoulder of the other person in front, and we would walk as if we were blind going down those stairs. Um, nine, 58 floors to street level and obviously light. As part of the following rebuilding efforts that year, 1994, it was a year after the bombing, uh, we installed, among other things, emergency backup lighting in stairwells and photoluminescent uh, strips uh, on the edges of the steps that provided speedier exit from the stairwell. We also, at the same time, in keeping with what the hotel people wanted to do, we uh, renovated the lobby of the Vista Hotel, which by 9-11, it became known as the Marriott Hotel. So to open up this portion of the hotel's second floor so that more natural light would come in from the street, we installed 80 inch deep steel girders to support the enlarged entrance area. Those girders in effect were taking the load of approximately one third of the weight of the hotel. Now fast forward to 9-11, that morning, which was a beautiful day as you may remember, I was sitting in the Southwest corner of my office when the first on, the, this is the 72nd floor of Tower One, when the first aircraft hit 20 floors above, I could feel the building oscillating back and forth several times. And at first, my reaction was that we were having an earthquake. It wasn't until I looked out of the south window, a ball of fire coming from above and parabolically falling on the roof of the Marriott Hotel, that I realized that something other than an earthquake had occurred. Conditioned by the 93 bombing, we that were in that office, we started to walk down the stairwell. And these stairwells were lit because of the emergency lighting place back in 94. But unlike the 93 experience, it was much faster and safer. Eventually a dozen of us wound up in the Marriott Hotel in the lobby. And we were trying to figure out what we should do next. So we were looking for a place where we could sit and talk about our next actions. At that point, we did not know that Tower 2 had also been struck earlier while we were in our stairwell descent. And we had no clue, no clue whatsoever, that at that precise moment, that building was collapsing on the hotel and on us. Because the tower floors were pancaking as they fell on each other, the air in between the <laughs> floors had to go somewhere. And they, by the time it went to the street level, it was like an extreme rush of air acting like a gigantic bomb the lobby windows of the hotel suddenly exploded inward and all that wind 
had picked us up like we were leaves and flung us. I remember falling as if I was doing a belly flop on my belly. And I thought at that moment that this was it. Everything went dark. The air became extremely sooty. And lying on my belly, I reached down to feel the rest of my body and limbs. I got a handkerchief out of my pocket to help me filter the difficult to breathe air. Everything was intact. My eyes burned, but I was okay. In that chaos, some of us worked our way south to Battery Park. Now we were outside, but yet we didn't realize that we were outside until we were able to see some of the street furniture. So in walking to the Battery, I looked back and to my utter amazement, I could not see Tower 2. Tower 1 was still there on fire and smoking, but Tower 2 was not there. We had no knowledge about Tower 2, so I couldn't compute. I couldn't compute what happened to Tower 2. Then a few minutes later, to my horror, I saw Tower 1 come down. Back in a makeshift office in New Jersey, I figured what had saved us. With the emergency stairwell lighting in place, we were able to walk down the 72nd flights in minutes rather than hours. And more importantly, miraculously, we happened to be beneath those same girders that were installed after the 93 bombing. These girders acted like giant umbrellas that shielded us from the falling debris. If we had been 10 yards either way, we'd have obviously died in that hotel lobby. So it was very hard on a personal level to come to terms with that tragedy. Um, we, I in particular, felt pangs of, of survival guilt. Why did we make it out when others did not, were not in a position to make it out? So for many of us though, adrenaline surged and duty called. As engineers, we had a big, big giant problem and we had to do something about it. So we had to identify what needed to be done, what needed to be planned, what needed to be accomplished. So driving into the rescue recovery and rebuilding efforts helped me and probably others who survived mass these feelings and thoughts. That was until I started to recount my story and share it with others, especially the engineering industry and the construction industry. This storytelling activity morphed into an ongoing series entitled Report from Ground Zero. And every time I spoke, my voice cracked less in severity and less often. A couple of months after 9-11, a former executive director came and he brought his daughter and his daughter observed what was going on. And these are the words that she basically said to me after witnessing the sight, the sadness and disbelief that this part of our lives, yours more than mine, is gone is difficult. But what I saw also left me with a strange feeling of hope. More than the wreckage, I noticed people working. I felt a purposeful, energy of lives dedicated to rising to this challenge. The wound is huge, but today I saw the healing effort is just as big. I must admit that I never viewed, and get this, cranes and bulldozers as instruments of healing. Can you imagine viewing construction equipment and as instruments of healing? So it was not just those pieces of equipment, but also the operators that worked 
uh, and they simplify, they exemplify the Teddy Roosevelt adage of working hard at work worth is doing. So these operators were also helped by others, engineers, architects, rescue workers, healthcare providers, police, fire, you name it, they were there. And they were all working together to accomplish a common goal. To us at the agency, it was clear that there was a cause. The 16 acre site was not a blank slate. We needed out of respect to clear it, to plan for a memorial and museum and to plan for rebuilding office towers, retail spaces and permanent train station. Thank you, Frank. It's uh, it's difficult to say anything other than uh, than listen with uh, respect. Rick, I think you were also had stories to recount from that day on 9/11. Rick is a partner at Lira Consulting Structural Engineers. Some people might not know Lira are the initials of Leslie E. Robertson. Um, Rick holds uh, both a uh, bachelor's and a master's of uh, in structural engineering from Cornell. And he joined Lira immediately since he graduated from Cornell. It's one of the few that have the distinction of holding a single job, I guess, uh, Rick. Rick specializes in a broad spectrum of public and private project types with a particular expertise in the design of academic buildings, healthcare facilities, labs, technical uh, institutions, and such. He was the partner in charge of LIRA's ongoing contract with the Port Authority World Trade Center Department from 1996 until May 30, 2002, when the city turned back the control over the World Trade Center site to the Port Authority and Silverstein for redevelopment. Uh, Frank, uh, Frank, I want to say that thank you for taking us from horror to almost exuberance in in the uh, response of the city. And so that was that was a tremendous story. Thank you so much. And and, and Frank, I want to say that my my partner Bill Fashion and his team designed those girders. So I think we all have to get together and have a beer someday <laughs> and toast to those girders. Um, the yeah, I, I wanted to I wanted to tell my story next because it really does parallel very closely with um, with Frank's and with the World Trade Department and with Lira, um, and it has multiple parts. And um, and I and I often can't get through it very easily because it was just a very very long day, emotional day. But I'm going to give it a crack. Um, first of all, as as Najib mentioned, I was director of Lira's work at the World Trade Center um, up until 9/11, and I had a team of engineers and and architects also working with me. We had an office in. Uh, the South Tower, Tower 2 in the 30s. Um, and on that day, 9-11, I had a team of engineers, Billy Howe and Pei Long Huang, who were doing local law 11 inspections. And they were going to do drops. They did these inspections from window washing platforms, these removable platforms, outside of the tower, of course, they were scheduled to do drops on that morning in the North Tower, the North Elevation of the North Tower. That was the elevation that was first struck by a plane. The night before, their inspection was canceled. They worked with the uh, window washing, the Port Authority's window washing team on the roof of that building. And uh, needless to say, that team didn't make it. Our engineer, my, my engineer, all of my engineers actually, uh, they chose on their own for some reason to not go to our office on the 30th floor of the South Tower that day. They all returned to our main office. They figured, well, we weren't going to do our inspections, so we'll write reports. And uh, and so, good luck number two. Lucky thing number two was that we had no one in our South Tower office on that day. 
remarkable. Um, so that's you know, the first part of the story. The second part is uh, talk a little bit about um, what we were doing and what I was doing in our office that morning. So I arrived around eight o'clock as, as um, Frank said, crystal clear day, just a beautiful, gorgeous day with, with the breeze coming out of the Northwest. And we all learned afterwards that the airline industry called a day like that severe clear. And, um, and so I was in my office around eight o'clock and I was meeting with, and we were on 30 Broad Street, which is about eight blocks away. We're on the, we were on the top two floors of our building and we just had this amazing panoramic view um, of the city from that building, terrific. And we can of course see the World Trade Center towers every day. Um, I was looking out the window, meeting with one of my engineers and, um, and all of a sudden, we saw paper flying by on the 48th floor of this building and paper is flying by the window. And the only thing I could think of was a ticker tape parade because just a year before we saw that when the Yankees won the World Series. And I said, you know, that's, there was no reason for a ticker tape parade. We craned our necks, looked over in the direction the paper was coming from, and we couldn't see the north elevation of the North Tower. We could only see smoke coming out of one of the corners. So we had no idea what happened, but you know, clearly smoke was coming towards us, paper was coming towards us. Eventually, people in the office turned on the radio to uh, see what was happening. The first reports were that you know, a small commuter plane hit the towers. And so we really still didn't know what the magnitude of the problem was. Um, and it was just, I don't know, Ten, five, ten minutes after we noticed that that I got a call from um, Frank Martini. He was one of the directors of the World Trade Department facilities, and he was just frantic. His his office was located I forget the floors, but two floors below the impact. So it was up in the nineties, and it was two floors below the impact. He had no idea what happened. He just knew something happened. His office was completely destroyed. Uh, after he took care of his employees, he called me and frantic and said, Rick, there's been a massive explosion and I need you to gather a team and meet me at uh, the lobby of the center town right away. And so, hung up the phone. I gathered a team, Billy Howe, Bay Long, my partner, Rich Garlock, and I think we had one or two other folks as well. We just gathered hard hats. We had respirators from 1993. We brought those along with us, grabbed some drawings, and we were running over to the World Trade Center Tower 2. We got within about Oh, four blocks, I would say three or four blocks, and just heard this roar over the sky. Uh, and what is that? We looked up and there was a low flying plane. Mind you, we still didn't know what had happened to Tower One at this time. We looked up, there was a low flying jet just skimming over top of the buildings, the Deutsche Bank building, and then it hit hit the cell tower. <laughs> so that's <clears throat> where it always gets tough. And so we saw this massive explosion and it just completely numbs you. We, you know, you just, don't even know you're an existing human, just completely blank. And it took a few moments to recover. And we knew we couldn't keep going there. So um, what we decided to do at that time was to turn around and go back to our office. So we were probably a minute, a minute and a half from being at the south entrance of the south tower right below where the planes hit um and we went back to our office and we spent the uh the rest of the day 
um, sort of organizing our office. Um, and uh, I, uh, our priority was to see to the safety of our staff. So what we did is, um, you know, Rich Garlock was really instrumental in this. Uh, the calmness within the office was amazing. I mean, nothing like, no reaction like this now. You just, you, everyone's really calm and working together. First thing we did is we, we established the buddy system to make sure that we, we, we encouraged people to stay in the office because clearly the city was under attack. We encouraged people to stay in the office. We, as Rich, assembled a buddy system, made sure everyone in the office had someone that they could leave eventually with and, if necessary, go to that person's home. Um, and, um, and I was walking around and just, just, just kind of taking the temperature of people in our office. And there were some, so, you know, a couple of people who were really clearly disturbed and upset and, you know, sort of talk to them a little bit, try to, try to ease them a little bit. And, and our conference room looked right to the World Trade Center. So, um, a lot of my colleagues were in the conference room just watching uh, there was the gaping hall in the South Tower that we could see. And clearly there was a smoke coming out of the North Tower. And, um, and you know, I was sort of walking around the office every once in a while going and taking a look. But the, um, we got a call from the New York Times. And, of course, they wanted to know, you know, what we knew about the towers. And so I thought, well, I ought to take that call. And, um, and they were asking some questions and I was talking to them briefly. And as I was talking to this reporter, I heard screams coming from our conference room. And the person on the other line just gasped and hung up the phone. And it was the South Tower collapsing. Well, at that point, it was just really utter chaos in Armageddon in, in, uh, in lower Manhattan, um, complete darkness almost with all of the dust and debris and it was all blowing towards us from the nice northwest wind. We could hear roaring jets overhead and we kind of sensed and knew that that was our military taking control of the skies on around New York and around the east coast. Um, and it was very reassuring to hear that. But <clears throat> eventually, um, the smoke cleared enough, and I think we didn't leave. We, we, most people stayed in the office. We all finally decided that uh, around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, we all decided it was, it was safe to leave. We felt we can go outside and find our way home. And I was with a group of, I don't know, six, eight, ten people. Billy Howe was one of them. And uh, we just were walking through the streets of Manhattan trying to figure out where to go. And someone, probably a police officer, directed us to go over to the, um, um, you know, well, the, 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 the slips on the, on the uh, East River. And uh, in there, we got into a Department of Sanitation tugboat that took us up the East River to around 34th Street. And then we got off there and then eventually made our way home. Amazing. It's, it's clearly difficult. You relive it every time uh, you tell it, uh, Rick. We're also joined by Richard Tomasetti, a founding partner of Thornton uh, Tomasetti. Richard holds a master's degree in civil engineering from NYU. He was the principal in charge for Thornton Tomasetti, leading the consulting work under contract from the New York Department of Design and Construction to support the search and rescue and the recovery operations on the World Trade Center site immediately after 9-11. Uh, As I said, he's a founding partner of Thornton Tomasetti. The firm does carry his name. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering an honorary member of the American Institute of Architecture, and what probably he enjoys the most, an adjunct professor at Columbia University, as well as a former chair, as well as being the chairman of the Thornton Tomasetti Foundation. 
Richard, I think you were down on the site. You went down there uh, soon after you heard uh, of the impacts. Do you want to recount that morning or that afternoon? Sure, Najib. Uh, just catching my breath after listening to uh, Frank and Rick, even though I've heard some of this before. <laughs> Hearing it again always has the same the same effect. Um, so that morning, actually, early in the morning, I was at a meeting in Midtown in the New York, the New York Building Congress. And I guess it was approaching eight o'clock or something like that. And uh, Dean Angelakis, who was one of the officers there at that time, came me to the meeting saying, an airplane just hit the World Trade Center. So we turned on the television and the meeting turned to watching the television. Okay, and someone asked me, uh, said, you're the structural engineer, can, uh, can those buildings collapse? Okay, and I said, no, they're highly redundant structures, not knowing at the time, the size of the plane, the amount of fuel, the, the speed, and it, that it was a terrorist attack. I just thought it was a, a stray. Um, Straight. Richard, if I can just interrupt for a second, can you speak up a little yes. bit? Yes, uh, not knowing at the time the size, is that better? Yeah. Yes. Uh, not knowing at the time the size of the plane and uh, the uh, extent of the fuel in the plane and the speed, thinking it was just like most people thought, a straight, straight airplane. Then it started to become obvious that it, that it wasn't that. Uh, and make a long story short, as things got worse, I left that office and I went down to my office and we were doing damage control in my office, trying to get places for people to sleep and everything. And by early afternoon, I got a call from, um, uh, 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 I'm just getting the blank here, I'm sorry. By early afternoon, I got a call from uh, uh, Mike Burton, who was the assistant commissioner at the Department of Design and Construction, and he wanted to hire us to provide him with 30 engineers to help Dan Eskenazi, who was the chief engineer at DDC, uh, to start helping with the search and rescue and, and, and recovery. So I, I said, fine, okay, but we'll, we can manage the, all of our own engineers. We'll do whatever we have to do for you. And the next thing I knew, I was directed to a van back up in Midtown so I could ride down with one of my associates at the time, Dave Peraza, in this van with four contractors from Amec, Bovis, Tully, and Turner Plaza to start mobilizing an approach for helping with the, the, the rescue. So we get down to the van the area we're about to go into the site this is approximately four in the afternoon and they said forget about it number seven is about to come down so we wound up in a meeting at the uh, police department headquarters down downtown waiting for number seven to come down and number seven finally came down and then we walked out onto the site and i still can't believe what i saw at that time we were probably, there was just 10 of us, plus some police police people, some federal people, uh, whatever. And everything was white. You could hardly see anything. Everywhere you looked, you saw some kind of military person holding some kind of military uh, weapon. It was probably one of the most frightening things that I've ever uh, uh, experienced. So getting into the engineering, we walked around the site a little bit and we uh, made a batch of observations. And then we went back to the police station. Uh, and but while, while we were at the site, right at that point, one of the uh, firemen, the, the chief comes over and we were looking at one, one of the buildings, uh, one of the Durst buildings and the one that had the big, big, big hole in it. And he wanted to know if he can send his men up to the top of the building. And just to show you like 
how, how, how the thinking gets all reversed. Uh, I said, well, what for? He says, we have to get a hold of the water and the water tanks in the top of the building. I says, well, where are your men now? He says, well, I have them in, in the basement of that building. He, he thought that was safe for some, some reason. Uh, eventually, we, we, we let him go, go up uh, making that decision at the time because we kind of knew it was a building from the 60s and it was a, a two-way uh, uh, structural uh, mold frame building. We felt it had a lot of redundancy. But then we moved on, made a few other on-the-spot decisions and then we sat back at the police office and we set up a system, okay? All, 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 all this eventually was led by, uh, uh, by Burton. He was just the natural leader. Just as a side story, he came down to the site thinking that his job would be getting nets to catch falling debris from the buildings. Okay, that's what he thought his job would be. And it turned out he became in charge of all the engineering and construction there. Uh, so we met and we split the site up into four areas. Okay? And then we made temporary assignments of how we would have different engineers support the contractors in all of those four areas and support the various uh, uh, public officials, the police and the uh, firemen in all of those four areas to give them support for some of the things that were already mentioned. How do you walk on this pile? How do you keep it safe? How do you know if something else is still going to fall on you? A lot of preliminary decisions were being made. And this went on until about 9, uh, nine, nine 9.30 that night. And then I got home and I called my partner, Dan Cuoco, and uh, with his help, May he rest, he's passed since then. Uh, uh, he started calling all of our key people to assemble 30 people so we can go down the site the next morning with a police escort, which uh, uh, Burton had promised me. So the next morning, we were at our place at seven in the morning, no police escort, they were just too busy. And we literally marched down from like 20th Street and had to talk our way through all the barricades to the police and everything, showing identification, uh, calling uh, people at DDC, uh, to talk to the police to let us through these various spots. The whole city was closed from 14th Street, uh, 14th Street uh, uh, down. And prior to getting down there, I don't remember if it was that morning or the night before, uh, my Partner Abe Gutman says, you got to call George Tamaro because we were concerned about the uh, um, slurry wall because George knows more about that slurry wall than, than anyone. So I, I, I called George and he, the first thing he said to me, he said, Richard, I don't know if George remembers this. He says, I'm, I'm looking through my slides, waiting for somebody to call me. So we arranged that George would meet us down at the site, which he did. Somehow he managed to get in all by himself, okay, without us even making the arrangements for him. Uh, and at, at that point, we started putting team, teams together. And also at that point, the Sioni members were so active in trying to help, they wanted to do it for nothing, but Department of Design and Construction said, no, we want a prime contract. And then every, all the engineers had to work under that contract and they wanted to do it, do it through us. And that's when we started the inspection of, of the buildings and helping the police, helping the uh, firemen especially, uh, and all the work that we did at the site, being named safety engineers. So I'll just stop there because there's a lot a lot else that was happening on that uh, sec second day. Thank you, Richard. You brought up the uh, the issue of the bathtub. Many people have heard about it. Few people really understand its function and its criticality to the site. We're also joined by George Tamaru. 
George was a senior partner at Muser Rutledge Consulting Engineers between 1980 to 2006, and he's a specialist in foundation construction. George holds a master's degree in civil engineering from Lehigh University, as well as a master's in architecture from Columbia University. But George, before then, joined the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey as a staff engineer very early on and stayed on until 1971. That means he joined when the very beginning foundation work of uh, the, the original World Trade Center was about to get started. It is during that time that he worked on the foundations of the uh, World Trade Center, but also got to practice what was a specialty, slurry wall construction, a technique that he had learned while he was in Italy. He then joined the firm ICOS that held the contract for that foundation work at the, um, at the World Trade Center, rising to the rank of chief engineer. After that, he joined Musa Rutledge as a senior partner from 1980 until his retirement in 2006. And he's been an active consultant to Muser um, since then. Yeah, George, I think you were involved in its original design and you were the go-to person whenever there was a worry about the slurry wall. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what its function is and what were the worries about it September 11 and thereafter? I'll start off by going back to 1967 when uh, I was asked to go down to the World Trade Center site to uh, oversee the construction of the foundations of the World Trade Center, which included the construction of the slurry wall. Uh, that was done by a company called ICOS, which I eventually ended up becoming chief engineer of. Um, fast forward to uh, September 11th. I was sitting in my office at uh, Penn Plaza and uh, my, what my daughter called me up and said that the plane had struck the uh, World Trade Center. And uh, I said, that's oh, probably some clown with a Piper Cub just sightseeing or something. Uh, with that, my son called in and he said, the plane hit the World Trade Center. So both of them were within two or three blocks of the World Trade Center at the time. Uh, at that point, we decided uh, to, uh, they were decided to uh, evacuate the area and they walked up north to uh, my office at Penn Plaza. Uh, at that point, I realized that uh, it would be important to provide information to whomever is going to be working on the recovery effort. And so I went home and I got a hold of my hard hat and all my equipment and my slide collection for the original World Trade Center construction and my slide collection for the financial center construction, uh, which I had been involved in as well. I felt that the slides would be very informative to the fire department in their recovery because it would de depict for them what they would encounter when they got down to grade level. Uh, that evening, I went to a firehouse in midtown Manhattan, was able to make photographs, prints of the print photographs of the slides and I provided them to the fire department for their use in identifying where which objects were where. Uh, went home next morning, I was uh, getting myself prepared, got myself all ready to go to the site waiting for a call. I figured somebody would call eventually. And it was Richard, called up and asked if I could come down to the site. He was gonna make arrangements with, uh, with Burton to do, uh, get me uh, permission to come down to the site. Being impulsive and being a little bit arrogant, I didn't wait. Um, I had uh, I was working currently at the Port Authority on the uh, light rail at Kennedy Airport, and I had a uh, pass that permitted me access to the World Trade Center uh, and to other Port Authority facilities. So I started off uh, in Leonia, New Jersey, at the Jersey side of the bridge, driving south. Uh, I was stopped at the bridge and talked my way past. I got across the bridge at the ramp to the New Hudson, I got stopped again. I got stopped about four or five times. I talked my way all the way down to Dick uh, Tomasetti. And finally he came out of, looking out of a window and saw me standing there and invited me in, which started my relationships with the, with the World Trade Center. By the, by the way, the, I, I take the attack as a personal thing because first of all, 
I, I was responsible for building it. My daughter was three blocks away. My son was three, three blocks away. My son had just left the job a couple of months earlier at the 72nd floor of building two. And my son, Mark, in Washington was with the FEMA team at the Pentagon. So we have a very close familial relationship. Uh, when I was at the site with Dick on the 12th, uh, he introduced me to, uh, I forget his name now, the chief engineer of the port of, of the uh, city of New York, um, Dan Eskenazi. Dan Eskenazi. Dan Eskenazi, right. Uh, he introduced me to Dan, and I told Dan about the fact that there was a, uh, there was a uh, shaft in the middle of West Street that gave direct access to the tunnels, and there was a shaft uh, in front of Building B as well that would have led directly to the tunnel. If the wall was broached in any way and the water kept getting put into the site, it would get into the New York City system, subway system, by traveling through the Hudson, through the tunnels, under the Hudson, up to Hoboken, under the Hudson again, and up to 34th Street. So there was a potential for a, a sequential collapse or catastrophe. Uh, Dan got concerned by that and sent me out to talk to the fire department. I talked to the fire chiefs and told them about um, the decks that were in the street, the, the, they were at street level in VZ Street, and they were putting cranes on what was deck structure, which was loaded for very light loading. It was not designed for crane loading. And so I advised them and cautioned them about that. And I cautioned them about the, the shafts and then went, went on my way with my photographs. Uh, the next morning, which was the 13th, we mobilized about 20 people to send down to the site. Uh, and we were mobilized and, and on the site for uh, about what, nine months, I guess it was, nine months. Until, until May. My biggest uh, uh, pleasure in recounting is the fact that there was no one injured fatally. There was no one in, er, with a serious injury throughout the whole recovery effort. And that's a, that's a compliment to the quality of people that we had working there. Uh, I'll pick up on Frank's comments for a minute. I, I think that the team that was put together by both the contractors and by all the engineers was, was a superior team in as much as it came together with a disparate group of people from different organizations, never had worked with, with each other before, and they were able to meld each other. You know, the egos didn't, didn't uh, get in the way of anybody's activity. It was, it was a very collaborative effort, and I wish the devil would be acting the same way in the United States at this particular time. That's my part today to take. Thank you, George. I actually also thought it equally magnificent that it's not just engineers from competing firms setting aside the competition and working together. It's engineers interacting with other trades that they don't usually interact with. First responders, medical first responders, firefighters, etc. Everyone came together to achieve a mission. First, as you said, ensure a safe rescue operation. Few people, I think, understand that rescue can be as dangerous as the initial event. I mean, you very nicely depicted the potential catastrophe that could have occurred had the slurry wall been damaged. Um, I think the human spirit really was magnificent uh, at that time. I'd like to to go on a little bit segue from what you were talking about, clearly at some point, saving lives becomes, you know, no longer a realistic expectation. And the conversation needs to start turning towards recovery, yet psychologically, neither the city nor the population nor people who had lost loved ones, and especially not the policemen, the firefighters, NYPD were quite ready to transition from search and rescue to recovery. The nature of the engineering work, though, is different in those phases. I don't know, maybe Frank, as the chief engineer of the Port Authority, you want to comment as to how you lived that transition and how you helped bring reason and, you know, rationality to that uh, progression. I'm sure it wasn't neither easy nor smooth. 
Najib, there was always that challenge. Um, people were obviously estimating that the cleanup would take years. And obviously people wanted to make it quicker. But at the same time, how do you balance respectfully cleaning while at the same time you're looking at potential remains that might be there? So you just can't pick up that pile and put it in a dumpster and get it out of there. There was a respectful process to it. And that was the balancing act that had to be done. How many firemen and police were allowed there on the site to look at whether or not they saw remains before they took away that debris. That was the balancing act that had to take place. I remember going to a meeting with the current mayor at the time and his people, Michael Burton and others that were there, that were trying to get some reasonable direction as to we can't move fast without necessarily disregarding that disrespectful search for people. So that was the compromise. Do it quick, but at the same, do it respectfully. We had we had boots on the ground, um, including mine, uh, pretty much every day from uh, nine twelve onward. And I mean, my perspective of that is is really the same, except it, except that work, productive work, did happen during the necessarily respectful period of searching for remains. And the, and the fire department um, largely controlled that effort. But productive work continued. We were still able to get below grade. And, and George, we did it with, uh, with um, <clears throat> uh, Andrew and Pablo um, going below grade and, and mapping areas that were accessible. And we did that with firemen. And, um, and <clears throat> so we did assessments and mapping in those early days. The other thing is that the firemen often needed a construction crane to go move something so that they could look for remains in a particular area. So construction cranes were down there working within the first week. And you know, we were working with them to, you know, they would have to rig their crane up onto the pile in an area that wasn't quite as damaged as others. And we would work with them to assure that they could do it safely. And, and there was even reinforcement of structure occurring at that early time. So it was, it was a tough juggling act, as you mentioned, Frank, but productive productive work was going on and and it evolved the way it evolved and remarkably the whole site was eventually cleaned up in nine months. Let me just add, add something to uh, points you made, which is so correct. Uh, first, I, I just like the audience to realize that the engineers were on the site. We started with three shifts and then we went to two, two shifts, 24 hours a day. And those two shifts were 12 hours each, but they were really longer because it took an hour for the engineers who were leaving to brief the engineers who were coming on what they had just seen or had accomplished. And amongst all the different firms, the ones that you see here, and maybe 30 or uh, 25 uh, Sioni firms, uh, we were covering the sites, working with different a contract is helping them with things like Rick, uh, uh, Rick, Rick just said. It was just, just a massive coordination effort. And as someone said before, everybody knew what they were doing, not just the engineers, the contractors who came down there, the principals of the firm. The organization chart for that site was built around what people were doing already. It was a high percentage of content and a very little percentage of process, but it all came together with, with, with good, uh, uh, good management. But one story about rescue, okay? 
it's my opinion that the, uh, the the rescue really stopped a few days after the uh, event because they just weren't finding anybody. And every time they found remains, the whole site would come to a stop and just to show uh, respect. But nobody realized that there was hope. And one example, about a week or so after uh, we got down there, the fire department, they ruled the site. And they came into our site office and said, everything must stop until we can get a crane and try to reach over to the core area. I think it was Tower 2, because uh, we think there's some people trapped there that we can save and we could find. So... The only crane we had that could do that was an eight, I'm just giving one example, so you have some specific. It was an 800 ton crane. And if we brought it right up towards the slurry wall, its reach would be enough to get to the point where we can start digging and looking for those people. But George doing all of his analysis, okay, had set this rule that we can't put any additional weight on the soil within 30 feet or so of the slurry wall, because you could put more pressure on the slurry wall, which was just being held up in the inside by the broken floors that had fallen down there. Right? So what we did, we used some of the box columns that came down from the World Trade Center and we span them from the wall to some cribbing about 40 feet in the back. And then we put the crane rolling over those box columns. So the crane was supported in the back by the cribbing and in the front with just a vertical load on the slurry wall, not putting any pressure on the soil. And some of us thought it was really risky I actually decided not to tell George we were doing it until after we did it. <laughs> and it, it was the kind of things that we had to do. And as someone might predict, nothing was found. No one was found in, in, in that area. But that's just one example of the type of things like Rick was mentioning that we had to do for the, um, the contractors. Uh, the, to help in the in, in, in the search and the in the rest. There, there was there was a constant collaboration with the fire department and the police department. Yeah. The fire department had a, a one sing, single fireman who had the authority to permit us to work or not work in particular areas because of their concern. And Pablo and the fireman would go out and we'd have a discussion of whether or not we could proceed. And in most cases, we could proceed. But there was a, I think, in, in there having control of uh, the fact of whether or not we could proceed with the working in that area, they felt that they had done what they had to do to recover their colleagues. But it was always collaborative. It was always a, a working relationship. And uh, just another thing, uh, when you talk about the slurry wall being loaded by the 800 ton crane, uh, that, that's a judgment call. That's one of the, the things in engineering where you put your hand on your heart and you hope the hell it's gonna work. George, we never admit to doing that. <laughs> I'm sorry? We never admit to doing that. Yeah, well, you have to admit that's it. That's what we did. Because engineers, engineers should also did. develop good judgment besides being able to run a lot of numbers. I, I agree. And that is the ability to operate, reach rational decisions on the fly. And I think that's what Carol alluded to in her introduction. A sense of self-organization arose very quickly into the process among the trauma, but you know, he, the engineers turned into engineers pretty much on a dime. And that is a magnificent depiction of doing what needed to be done. Kind of, you know, it's difficult to say setting feelings aside but really people focused on the job, what needed to be done. The excuses were ample. We needed to save life, then we needed to recover. And that is my segue into, at some point, the city, the country needed to talk about what comes after recovery. 
is this hallowed ground or do we rebuild? Is rebuilding offensive to the memory? Or is rebuilding actually our symbol of resilience? Is it our comeback? And I do appreciate that much of that conversation was political in nature, was a policy issue, was a public feeling issue. But I suspect engineers were also part of that conversation. Frank, you were at the core probably of that back and forth with politicians and other people. What's your perspective on that decision making? Well, um, the biggest effort that took place back in 2002 was listening to the city at the Javits Center where a consultant that was hired to do preliminary design and to show the six schemes that they came up uh, was basically to um, show preliminary blocking of what that site might look like. And the overwhelming result of that was that they didn't think it was going far enough. So it became very clear that the people that were leading with the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, the Port Authority and others realized that then they had to go into some other form of decision making and they went into a design competition and that's when Liebeskin plan was selected and then there were more discussions about how to create that and make it realistic and they brought the uh, SOM and David Childs in there to revise that. And there were other competitions about what the memorial will look like. So this took some time in developing. And then ultimately, uh, Silverstein, um, to his credit, got four and a half billion dollars worth of insurance. And then there was some discussion as to who was going to actually manage that site. It still basically was leased to him. So he had a lot to say as well. So um, slowly but surely, there was agreement by around 2006 or so as to what could conceivably be built with the input from all with this competition as to whether the site would look like it is today with the memorials that was Michael Arids along with the landscape uh, architect, Peter Walker. So uh, it took time. It took time to digest those preliminary block designs that were only reflective of what could be happening there. And I don't think the people understood that that was just preliminary in nature, that further development of those plans had to be made and um, we move forward from there, but it, it did take some time to get it well organized. Um, and so that's what we have today. Um, and we're missing now uh, Tower 2, we're missing the performing arts that's still going up and the, the Greek <laughs> church. So we're getting there. Um, it, it will happen. Maybe in another couple of years, you'll be able to see the completion of the entire master plan that was originally evolving over time. You know, Frank, I think it, it necessarily took time. <clears throat> um, I, had, I was involved in a conversation with a lady who, um, who her children and her loved ones uh, were survivors of her husband was lost in the event <clears throat> and she said when uh, the memorial hadn't been decided yet still competitions for that she said whatever it is I want it to be deeply disturbing um, now I just say that not to um, reflect upon the memorial that was decided because it's fabulous um, but that was one person with a network, a small network of loved ones who felt really very strongly about that. And 
and there were some 3,000 people who perished there. And each one of those persons had their network of people who were who had a very strong opinion about what should be done at the site. So it was a really good thing that it took time and it needed to take time. And what we have is really pretty fabulous. What's also Can I just cut in for a second? Can I just make a comment? Yes. One, sure. one of the one of the salient features in the original designs was the exposure of the slurry wall in its current condition, exposed and removed, you know, with all the debris removed. And uh, I was an op opponent of it because I was very concerned that there was no understanding of the state of stress in the wall nor the wall's cap capacity to carry load in the future. You, you've got to remember that the wall was built, excavated, exposed, incorporated in the original World Trade Center, to, was exposed again and, and incorporated into this giant hole that we had. And he had no way of understanding what the condition of the wall was and assuring that it would be safe for 100 years. And as a result, I was very resistant to any any act that would incorporate that wall as part of a structure. It could be part of a exhibit, but not as part of the structure itself. I also think um, it was probably invisible to most people that while we're talking rebuilding, in the technical community, there was a parallel conversation as to whether we design and build the way we used to or whether there were lessons learned and we should go forward designing differently. I remember getting a phone call from an elected official asking me whether we could design against airplanes. This is, I'm sure, part of a myriad of these decision points that went on. So in concluding, we're getting close to the end. I would like, I would ask each of you to in a very personal way, say, looking back, we are on the 20th anniversary. What does it mean to you? What is the lasting impact of 9-11 on you personally, on the community, on the country, but also on engineers? Frank, since we started with you, I think I'd like to ask you to go ahead. I'd like to start with um, my engineering training back in the late 60s, uh, early 70s. You would go into a structural engineering course and um, you would learn what are the natural, natural forces that you would be designing those structures for, whatever it is, a bridge, a building, a port facility, or what have you. And students could easily list all those forces from nature that you would have to deal with. What these events have highlighted strongly, the 93, the 2001 attacks, is that now you have to add another element there, and that other element is the human force. You have people that are willing to give up their lives to do something that is unimaginable. And now you have to look at these structures, not only from the natural forces perspective, but also from human force perspective, and they go into a lot of risk analysis to see, well, what could possibly go wrong if someone did something unimaginable to them? So that is the biggest change that has happened as far as I'm concerned from an engineering perspective. Thank you, Frank. George? Um, I, I, you know, this may sound arrogant, but I don't think I would do anything different from the way we did proceed at the World Trade Center recovery. It was just, I, I thought it was managed. The relationships were extraordinarily good. Um, I would make a comment though on engineering education and Frank has heard me jump on this particular subject often. I would like to have a course in the freshman year or the sophomore year of structural engineering where you do a course called Guessing 101 
where you don't go and open a handbook to come up with a solution, but you use your judgment on how a structure should be built and how it should function. If you can't figure out how it functions and how it should be built, you're really not designing the structure. That's my piece. Thank you, George. Richard? Well, uh, just taking off from what Frank said, one of the things we teach now in school through engineers is that you have to design for the design threat. It's like a new force. And there's all this risk analysis that's done to determine what that is. But I want to get off of that and I want to conclude with one more story because talking about risk, most people don't understand how terrible things could have been at the World Trade Center site. One quick story on a Sunday afternoon, two to three weeks after the beginning of everything, I remember getting a call at home and I was told they saw a big, big crack in the ground. So we ran down to the site. And then I know George got down there also. And there was this like five inch opening in the ground. And moving. And moving, all right, from right, right adjacent to the uh, slurry wall on the, the south side of the uh, site. We had already been pumping out water to get pressure off the, the wall. We wanted to start excavating and getting everything out of the bathtub. And the slurry wall is moving in. So to, we, we went down there and I remember being on the inside with my hard hat on and I think I, think I was with George and we passed comments saying, well, what the hell are we doing in here, okay? So what we had to do very quickly is we had a pump we kept pumping, but we had to get emergency sand and dump it into the site to reinforce the wall from the inside of, of the bad top to stop the movement of that wall. And then after we did all of that, we had to start all over again of digging out that sand, putting rock anchors in one level at a time as we went down. But my point is, our group here is to learn about engineering. The, the amount of risk that you take in a situation like this, you do things not because you know you'll have a factor of safety of 1.8 or 2, but you're doing things because you looked at it so carefully that you believe you have a factor of safety of 1.1 or 1.2 that you can rely on. That's what you have to do in emergency. <clears throat> that Dick was an, is an example of when judgment becomes a predominant uh, element in engineering. It's right into your judgment point, George. Thank you. Rick, how about yourself? 20 years later, what do you see? Um, I, what I see is that youth and the youthful energy in our industry and in other industries is so important. So let me, let me uh, go into that a little bit. I, I'm gonna look at sort of three globe shaking events and, and how youth was so important in when directed with the wisdom that we see in, in this group. We definitely need wisdom. And we definitely need the direction of wisdom, but we need the youthful energy to solve globe shaking problems. So number one, the original design of the World Trade Center towers was an incredible undertaking. The Port Authority, the architect, the engineering team, Les Robertson's contribute, contributions to the design were really a, a world shaking event. Right, it was the World Trade Center, and in in the 20th anniversary has caused me to need to go back and look at things uh, for various reasons. And so, there's <clears throat> I just want to show you Les's memoir. Um, 
I was looking, reading in there, and there's this one quote in there that's amazing. Les Robertson was in his mid-30s when he took over the direction of the structural engineering design of the World Trade Center Towers, which is just remarkable. Um, and paraphrasing from his book, he says, totally demanding of one's energies and talents, this was a young person's project. This was not a place for people who knew where they were going. Instead, it was for us, it was for those of us intent on discovering where to go. We set out to design modern buildings, standing on the past, but taking a new step forward, making full use of the latest technologies, even where we had to devise them. Youthful energy. And, and then I take us to the, um, sorry, uh, then I take us to the events of 9-11. And again, lots of wisdom around the table that was so, so important in the recovery. Um, but there was youthful energy there. I, I had a team of young engineers who, who really devoted an effort. Sioni had a team of young engineers. George, you do, did. Richard, you did. Uh, the youthful energy down there is, it was really what, what did the work under the direction of wisdom. And then, um, and then I'd like to bring it to present. And, and I think one of the the biggest concerns and dangers for humanity is climate change. And if you look who's making the most noise with regards to climate change, it's the youth. And you know, we, we're all too busy making sure our firms are still running and that we're providing for our employees. And, and, and I don't believe that we can pay the proper attention to that, but the youth can. So I, I am a great optimist for this country and for the world, and I think it's because of youthful energy. Rick, I should show this recording to my son. He'd be cheering for you. <laughs> He's one of those who says we're not doing enough. Carol, I know we went a little bit beyond the allotted time, but it was difficult to bring this panel to a close. It was an amazing journey. I'll let you close it. Yes, uh, thank you, Najiba. It is my job to, to, to close down the show, I'm afraid. But um, that's by way of not just thanking you, but also suggesting um, that all of our audience return when, um, and I'm so glad Rick mentioned our, our good dear friend, Les Robertson, who passed this year, um, because uh, I think I met almost all of you, um, Frank and George and, and Richard, when the, when the Twin Towers were standing, um, as I interviewed you about how, what, what were these buildings of the 20th century, the kind of culminating structures of, of the 20th century. Um, so the Skyscraper Museum has always been interested in the World Trade Center. Um, we're happy that, or we're, we're gratified that we can help to document its, these different ages of the history of the site. Um, and in remembering Les Robertson and, and Rick, what you mentioned, um, one of the quotes, one of the audio um, uh, clips that we had in an exhibition on, on giants, the Twin Towers in the 20th century, was, was Les talking about a new kind of building. He called the World Trade Center a new kind of building. Um, and he did say, as, as you mentioned, Rick, that it, that it was a, a young people's project. It was a young man's project um, in, in the structural engineering. It was um, an entirely new venture for the Port Authority to believe in this different kind of structure. And by means of segueing to the second part of the engineer's story, um, as we take this longer view, um, in these last, these last comments, so many of you have mentioned risk. Um, and it's Najib who is going to take us into that story of risk um, and is going to um, uh, summarize the 10 year forensic study of why the towers fell in the first part of the session, which is going to be on September 29th, uh, and um, to validate the engineering of Les Robertson and how it did save lives um, in the end. So we'll, we'll hear that part of the story, but then we'll hear this second part about the 20 years, um, the, the evolution of 20 years and the 
predominance of risk in the way that we think about about buildings um, and safety. So I invite everybody to come back on September 29th. Before that, uh, we started to talk about master plans in this session as well. And the first of the two sessions on the master plans for Ground Zero, um, called the cultural component, um, is going to be on September 21st. And there, uh, Lindsay Galen, who wrote the um, an amazing uh, tome, uh, Power at Ground Zero, uh, will be the, both the speaker and the moderator for that session. And Gary Hack, who worked on the site planning for um, the Leibskin Studio, will um, help to set the stage as the moderator. And Craig Dykers um, of Snowetta will talk about the design for the, the memorial and the, and the museum. And Frank Siami um, will also uh, talk about, especially the Performing Arts Center, but his work um, with the LMDC and the, the, the class an analysis of the site. So this first part of thinking about the master plan to take us from engineering um, to the architecture planning and redevelopment of the site um, is part of this larger agenda that we will continue to explore in about five or six programs over the fall semester, as it were, as we remember 9-11. Uh, so I thank you all so much for your experience, your your wisdom, your perspective, and, and for sharing the emotion of, of the um, of, of your experience as well. And thank you, Najib, for putting this together and, and for bringing us back um, in a couple of weeks to be maybe a little more analytical um, and, uh, and, and removed uh, um, than this launch of, of taking us all back to that moment. So thank you all so much tonight for being with us. And we hope we'll see you all um, in the audience back for all of the rest of the series. Take care and good night.